Dialogue, a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News. This is Dialogue Assassination with Research Specialist May Bressel. For KLRB, I'm Gloria Barron. Well, May, you have a number of things to talk about today. And I, I might mention that uh, today we'll be talking about J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, That's a Nixon, popular subject. Yes, yeah. Nixon and B.B. Rebozo, who's been um, in the news of late. <laughs> and uh, the justices of the Supreme Court. Now, where do you want to start? Well, I think I'll start with an article in Time magazine this week. It's dated October the 25th, 1971. Gloria, this is in reference to my research and to the subject of B.B. Rebozo and Richard Nixon. Um, the title of the article is called The Return of Muckracking. The section in Time magazine is called The Press. The definition of muckracking, for those of you who are too young to remember what that was. Or muckraking. Muckraking, yeah, muckraking. Uh, it was a type of journalism that was done in the 1900s, oh, years ago, of investigative journalism. They didn't, instead of having news headlines that come out today that just flash on and don't follow through with an investigative course, newspapers used to have an investigator on the staff who spent a lot of time looking into the background of the origin of an article or making the headlines by exposing somebody, particularly the time of elections, if they have scandals in their past. They would do investigative work on the candidates and expose these scandals. The, de the dictionary defines it as a search for and an ex to expose real or alleged corruption and scandal in politics. Now, the article in Time Magazine goes on to say, that this investigative reporting didn't used to be studied at Columbia University. It was a thing that the uh, where they're teaching at the American Press Division at Columbia University. Three years ago, few pay, few people were learning the art of investigative training, and now three quarters of all the 36 papers represented at Columbia University have one investigator doing research work on uh, learning how to investigate. Time what goes on to say, muckraking is the result of months of patient digging into musty public records, dogged cross-checking rather than from secret informants. That you go, instead of somebody telling you, whispering about B.B. Rebosa and Richard Nixon, this particular article, this is what the subject was about, um, goes into systematic six-month research into the financial relationship of these particular people, their stock holdings and their um, relationship to defense contracts and so forth. Now, uh, as far as the Time Magazine goes, it said that it, the work is done, it's patient digging into musty public records. And I have to say that my type of work is identical to what these investigators are doing now, but it isn't old or musty. <laughs> and that sometimes I start my work before the body is even cold. Like in the case of John Kennedy, the answers were in so quickly when they found Oswald and no other suspect that I began to save articles right then, you know, and even before the funeral. And I went on uh, to study people in our political world, and I study certain persons, where they work, who they work with, how they travel, their contacts, their contacts with certain police departments. And by the time a crime is committed, I already have a folder on these particular people. I have an unusual, I'm not muckraking, I am saving, I'm not going into the dusty files, but I can predict certain events like Ted Kennedy's accident. These are documented in correspondence with these people or Robert Kennedy's murder or the massacre that was to come down to so the hippies would be discredited or the prison riots that are taking place. Um, I can talk about a particular person up at San Quentin, a Jesse Phillips, who is life has been threatened, and say uh, the, they're planning. They've already asked certain people to uh, kill him, and because I know what is going on in our system, and people come to me and provide me with information, I watch the people who are doing these things before the murders take place. But I give them warning, and I write, and I call and scream, or like I'm on the air saying, this is going to happen like George Jackson said, I'm going to die, or Malcolm X said, I'm going to be killed. And you begin to see 
why he's going to be killed, what is he saying that would make him be killed, who is he threatening? And you watch the people that he is accusing of being his enemies, and you see who they make the deals with and how they connect with other people. And then by the time he is killed, which is a tragedy, you already have a pattern, a modus operandi. So um, Time Magazine went on to say that they now keep four Newsday newspaper in Long Island keeps four to 11 men researching special projects. Newsday is a newspaper that carried a series of articles that were not in our Monterey Herald or the Chronicle, but the San Jose Mercury carried a series of articles for five continuous days. They were the week before last. And I didn't have time to sit down and take them apart like I wanted to until this weekend. And the articles, the research that Newsday did is what I'm going to be talking about in terms of Richard Nixon and B.B. Rebozo because they did send a team out to investigate the relationship of George Smathers and B.B. Rebozo. Now, the article goes on to say that the purpose, I'll read you the conclusion of, of the research, and then I'll go on and tell you what they found. Um, the person who ordered the research said, we are not looking for criminals. We are trying to produce a detailed, factual account to tell people how their government really works. Now, a lot of people have asked me, what are my motives for doing research on the assassinations or uh, watching world figures as they move around and go about their business and wondering why they're island hopping to certain places? I do that kind of research that the men are doing in these particular newspaper things, and my subject is political assassinations, because I want to know how the government works. And the only way you really know is not what they say, but what banks they bank at, how much land they bought, what they paid for it, what they sold, did they own that land and never had to pay any payments on it till the investigator showed up, you know, uh, what was the mortgage on it? Did, was any money transpired? If it wasn't, how do you accumulate masses of money without any cash to begin with? Um, I'm trying to stick with the public records that are filed in the counties, or these men were doing that. I'm sticking with sworn testimony, FBI reports, and documents of the State Department to see how our government really works. Now, for those of you who don't know these names, George Smathers, was the Democratic senator from Florida at the time John Kennedy was president. And he lives in the Miami area. He voted against everything that Kennedy wanted, and they asked him why did he do that, and he said, well, the president understands. He happened to be the best man at or one of the ushers at John Kennedy's wedding. But I think this was it had to be probably a political kind of thing that Kennedy recognized Miami or Smathers was moving in into the presidency to see if he could help control it in some way. So George Smathers was a Democratic uh, senator from Florida, but his associations were with Lyndon Johnson and with the Republicans in that area. And B.B. Rebozo was a man who lived in the Miami area who I've kidded about on the show, but I know he had a very important position because he lives on the compound with Richard Nixon. He's the only person outside of the Secret Service who lives right inside the Nixon dwelling, has his own bungalow, and he drives Richard Nixon everywhere. The Secret Service is behind them, and he is with him at Camp David, and wherever he vacations or with his family or with the family celebrations, Rebozo is always there. And he has become a millionaire down in the Miami area. He has a bank. He has a lot of property. And the team of B.B. Rebozo and George Smathers is a fascinating team. And the reason, again, that Mr. Green goes into them is he wants to find how the government really works. And his main target, he said, for the articles, the most distinguished target in the country is the president of the United States. Now, the title of the articles wasn't uh, Richard Nixon's Connections in Florida, but this series of articles, if you didn't get them in the San Jose Mercury, you might go to the library and Take them on a copying machine and copy them down if you are a serious student of what I'm saying because a lot of you are taking tapes and getting the books and you've become really serious. Some people are keeping notebooks now and, and spending at least one or two hours a night taping in articles and so forth. It's really far out. And this is a good collection because this is only the beginning of what's going to come very soon. Now, one of the articles that Newsday put out on a town called Islip in New York 
similar to this type of article, won 17 awards, including the 1970 Pulitzer Prize. It led in, to the indictment of 21 persons, the conviction of seven people, the resignation of 20 public officials, and they managed this without one libel suit. My, um, my work is such that I'm sticking with the documents, what they signed, what they said under oath, and I feel I will be protected, too, because I am sticking like Newsday is doing with their own acts. And this is where the power is going to come to effect changes in our society. When you have the facts of the way the wheelers and dealers work, they can be indicted, they can be removed from office. And we haven't begun to hear the, the problems that Mr. Rebozo and Smathers and Richard Nixon are in down in the Miami area. Now, when I, I spent three days on this article and cross-filed over and over again. And after I just about threw with that work, the Time magazine came and told me that the man, this Mr. Green, who instigated this article, he worked with Bobby Kennedy as a staff investigator for the Senate Rackets Committee in 1957. Now, this is interesting because I could smell something coming through here that was really heavy. And he was saying something. It isn't all in the Mercury articles. Maybe they'll mention one name like I do on the show. A lot of people say, well, you go so fast, you'll mention a name like Damore and Shield or George Bowie. We don't know those names. That name invokes a thousand images. And I move along, and I can't do a whole show on those names. And this man put five articles. And just the suggestion of what is in those five articles is very heavy. So I took those newspaper articles, and I broke them down. I'm going to show you how I broke them down into these categories. So this is what it involves Richard Nixon in this area, and I say you're going to hear more about it. I broke it into the space defense contracts involving uh, Smathers, Rebosa, and the use of the mafia and the gangland and the pressure that congressmen have and the use of political money on presidents to give contracts to companies that would – be disbarred from having these contracts if they weren't, if they come to Richard Nixon and dangle $6 million in campaign contributions and a lot of other things. And then the pressure is put on in certain corporations like Aerodex, even though the planes are malfunctioning, to give them the new contracts. It, I have a section on the mafia and underworld. The connections going down there are very heavy. When the government has a small business loan that they give to build a huge shopping center, they not only don't give it to the poor blacks or the underprivileged in that area, the ex-mayor of Havana screens out who will the tenants be, and Bibi Rebosa turns out to be one of the tenants in a secret deal with uh, his hand in a profit laundromat. But the builder is an ex-gangland underworld figure who testified before the Key Faber committees, a big boss, underworld boss in narcotics and so forth from Cleveland, builds the entire shopping center for the small business loan. I cross out under LBJ with Nixon and Rebozo because all along I've said we have one government. We have a one-party system. And after Kennedy was dead, Smathers went to the White House every week to eat with LBJ. When Kennedy was alive, as a Democrat from Miami, he wouldn't vote through his bills. But they're very thick, and it seems that Lyndon Johnson had visited the private resort, private islands of these people, and was a part of that team. Then I cross out under the Bahamas. And Sturgeon, I mentioned last for Mr. Sturgeon, who is a group of men who turn out to be underworld figures. And I found under there, I found under the Nixon Rebosa friendship, which is very strange. And then I find in the article, I file under Rebosa his background. When I say file, I start a manila envelope and I give it a label. And then from that day on, any more information on that subject, I put into an envelope because the the story of B.B. Rebozo was that he was a chauffeur and he was a garage mechanic and he learned to fly airplanes for Pan American for a while and then he went back in, he was went back to the Miami area after he flew these airplanes. He wasn't in the service per se, but he took these Pan American planes around and went back to having a a contact with his classmate Smathers, George Smathers, he knew in high school, and his road to financial success and fame to be the president's became very sudden. Well, all I got from these articles the fact that Bibi Rebozo flew for the Strategic Air Command. I never knew it. And he flew to the Gold Coast in Africa. And Mr. Green's telling us he flew empty airplanes. Can you imagine flying? He went from Miami down to Puerto Rico to Brazil and then to the Gold Coast in Africa with the Strategic Air Command. 
So I began then to look up the, uh, Richard Nixon's background in, before he became a senator, and he worked for the Strategic Air Command in, in the Far East. And it turned out, last week we mentioned how an ad was placed in Pasadena for a congressman to run. They said wanted one man to run for a member of the House. And Richard Nixon answered the ad, and I was looking up the reference when I got home to see exactly how it was worded. And memory had played a funny trick. I hadn't read this in four or five years. The ad was placed in the paper, and I have a copy of the ad. But the point is that Richard Nixon was still in the service, and he was in Maryland. And a man, gentleman, a banker that I'm doing some research on, telephoned him and said, are you a Republican or a Democrat? And Richard Nixon uh, said, well, I think he was registered Republican at the time. He was for Wilkie once. He said, well, come on out. You're going to run for Congress. And that was how, now, when I was doing research on the Supreme Court to see if the names mentioned were in my files under the John Mitchell file, and I went through my filing cabinet last night, I came across the fact that not only did Richard Nixon never meet John Mitchell until three years ago, but John Mitchell was a rev he was registered not Republican or Democrat, independent. And you have all these people, Agnew switching, Mitchell. I say that it is an intelligence government and it's controlled by these people who are not traditionally the political people. They're the behind the scene maneuvers with the headquarters in Jamaica. And this is a strong statement. But I have to tell you, in, in going through the articles on the background of Barbosa, it said Strategic Air Command. Isn't that interesting, Gloria? <laughs> and he and possibly he and Richard Nixon um, met in the Strategic well, Air Command? Or? or someone up above. This is the way I analyze it, is that the orders, it, you know, it makes sense when you look back. You know, we... At the end of World War II, we were the largest, richest nation. Everyone else was down on their knees. We were starting, the OSS became the CIA, and Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles selected Eisenhower and said they made all the policies for him. So we had a military man in office for eight years. Now, it would be ridiculous, all this money and all that wealth of the Gold Coast and the oils and the minerals of the world, wouldn't it be ridiculous to groom a man for vice president who wasn't Behoven to all these people. See, I always thought Richard Nixon was behoven to a group in San Marino, but they wouldn't just pick all of these goodies and, and let one man be the vice president. It wouldn't make sense. So that I feel that because of my research into political assassinations and the team that really works is, is connected with the Air Force and the space and the Nazis that came over under the guise of building up a space program. We imported many Nazis. And the Strategic Air Command is like Dr. Strangelove, if you remember. It's it's all there. And uh, as I was cross-finding these articles, somebody at my home asked me if I'd seen Dr. No or any of these movies of Fleming's. And I said no because he mentioned that this is the total. As I was going over all these articles about Nixon and Rebozo and Smith, it was identical to the Dr. No series. And the gangland comes in on the secret island and so forth. And I didn't know they existed. Well, anyway, getting back to the law... The articles in Newsday in Long Island, it suggests a marvelous place for safe houses, a particular island on Kay Bay that was owned by two particular people, Rebozo's lawyer and another gentleman, his partner, business partner, and he was the secret owner. Rebozo was so many, he was secret on so many things. I filed under CIA safe houses with a question mark, because this you'd never know, but it'd be a perfect place. The government bought the land from them, but nobody gets on it. You know, it became a public park in 69, but the political government had changed hands by 69. You didn't even need safe houses anymore, but uh, three weeks before John Kennedy was killed in Dallas, the police department picked up a man and took a tape recording that he was supposed to be killed in Miami. And he, a man with a gun that was not assembled to come in a, put in a paper bag and go to a tall building, and he wouldn't be the one to shoot. He would be the decoy, and He'd be arrested, and it's on a tape that is published for all the researchers, anyone who wants to see it, on how it was going to happen. And the police department notified the Secret Service, so instead of John Kennedy taking a motorcade in Miami, they airlifted him, they had a helicopter that took him to where he was speaking. But he was supposed to be killed in Miami. So um, then he was supposed to be killed in Chicago, too. So there were places. Uh, there are places, so it's very interesting that these particular islands are owned by persons
close to Nixon, very close, and George Smathers and so forth. I file this under Air Force contracts and um, Air Transport Command. And I do it under Rebozo's background, and then I also do it under Air Force, and I do it under these articles gave me uh, information that Donald Nixon was called by Rebozo when Rebozo was found holding stolen stocks. He called to Donald Nixon in California and to investigate this particular place that a mutual friend of theirs uh, had, was building parts for an airplane factory in Miami. And Donald Nixon said, I don't remember who I called and I don't remember what he said. Well, you can imagine. <laughs> there will have to be some indictments on all of this. They can't just forget that. You know, uh, Why would you call Donald Nixon about that? And then I, I also, when I read the article, I make a divider called public officials who are breaking the law, who are not paying uh, payments on their land, the kind of fees they're getting. And this is the kind of thing these lawsuits, I think, will have to come out very soon. And then I cross file thing under secret dealings where the names were hidden from the actual ownership. And I go into Nixon's campaign because I keep uh, a whole filing him on Richard Nixon, maybe 30 subjects. Nixon's family, Nixon's money, Nixon's friends. And sometimes you're cross-filed in two places, but you come out with a picture of what's going on, and then you put under FBI and stolen stocks. Well, this Time Magazine article uh, covers all the corruption and suggests problems in many areas. I can't go into each one. I have the material here. There is this island at Adams Key that was owned by Rebozo at Coco Lobo K Bay, sold to the U.S. government. That is one subject brought up in the articles. The subject of Aerodex, the defense firm, how they were going to lose their contract and the pressure put on to let the government do it. There is a subject on the American Horse Council that there were tax loopholes, that horse owners, the racetrack people, have loopholes that would save the American taxpayers millions of dollars. The provisions on the selling of horses was done for the farmer, the poor farmer all over America, and the racetrack people got in on it. And through the influence of Smathers, who has retained at very high fees, the tax benefit continues to go to the American Horse Council. So if your taxes go up, the horse people go down. Uh, the utility company that Rebosa owns, the Florida Power and Light Company, is involved here. And this is terrible. You know there's a case going on in San Francisco with Mayor Alioto. And the utilities up in Washington State, and a fee of $2 million he got, uh, politicians, are making so much money off of your gas, your light, electricity, your water. Someday they'll uh, just have to be put back in the hands of the people. You know, my bills come at $40 for water, $30 for gas, you know, and $50 for electricity every month, something like that. Anyway, I the subject in the Bahamas, the Mafia Syndicate, stretching all the way from Alabama to California, Miami. There's a whole section on stolen FBI stocks. And Rebosa, and, not stolen FBI, the FBI comes to see Rebosa. They're stolen stocks from E.F. Hutton. And they were sitting in Rebozo's bank, and when the FBI came, he sold them the next day. Not that he thought anything was wrong with them, but he thought he may as well sell them. And then all the Newsday articles come into the small business loans, how hard it is in Detroit, Chicago, and other states to get any money for people to get loans to open their own small businesses. So the government was to come in and get them started on their business because they have no credit and the bank wouldn't give them credit. And the idea is to let people start their own small businesses. So instead of giving it to other areas with a lot of pressure, one hunk of money was given to B.B. Rebozo for a small business loan. And he had a lot of places where he could get loans from that he didn't talk about and a lot of places where money would come in. But he built this huge mall and shopping center, which is half empty, and the, and the government guarantees the rent. Nobody's using half of it. And then last year, a Canadian bought it. And, of course, I'll do research on the Canadian, and I'll write to Mr. Green. And that word rings a thousand bells to me in terms of assassination planning and J. Edgar Hoover and the racetrack people up in Montreal. So if a small business thing isn't making it, and the money was allocated for the people in the Florida area, why does a Canadian buy it? That brings up a lot of problems because there certainly must be some people in Miami wanting to open their own business that don't have money. And then it, there's an article on the Florida fruit lands. And then another article on Rebozo with his godson. He had very close friends, and they were killed in an airplane crash going over Japan. 
and left an estate of $250,000. And Rebozo was the godson. He became the executor on the estate with the boy's uncle. There was a 17-year-old boy that survived. The boy got $7,000, and Rebozo and the uncle each got $60,000. And when Newsday did their investigating, the boy didn't even know that his folks had that kind of money. You know, they, they didn't know that his godfather had $60,000 from the estate, and the boy had 7000 He's working for some clothing store in Florida, and he didn't even know this was existing. So there may be a suit on that. He didn't have much to say it right at the time. So if you read Time Magazine on muckracking, I think you'll find it really interesting. Now, another article we're going to talk about, Gloria, is called The File on J. Edgar Hoover. Oh, yeah. I think that, that people who listen to this show might buy Time Magazine if you don't buy it or copy these pages because Time Magazine on page 14 has a two-page article on J. Edgar Hoover. You know, he's having his trouble with the agencies. And there's a picture of the files of 1920 and 1930 and 1940, and then the 50s, 60s, and 70 are coming down and hitting him on the head. There's a cartoon, and he's sort of uh, being knocked over by uh, the work. It's knocked him out. Now, what's happening to poor J. Edgar Hoover? Uh, he's having a bad time in Washington. I predicted he would four years ago when Howard Hughes moved into Vegas, and we've talked about this before, and, and people would say, even people that worked at Hughes Aircraft in San Mica, my brother-in-law said, why is Hughes moving in in the dead of night of Vegas? And I said, because I've been studying a police state for four years. And in a police state, you can't have too many bosses, and you're talking about an intelligence system, intelligence operation, a behind-the-scenes government. And they're going to squeeze out J. Edgar Hoover. He's going to be the second man. And the intelligence system, and Mr. Hughes must be Mr. CIA, or a group of men representing the intelligence, munitions, places, and you, the FBI will be squeezed out. And then, just starting a year ago, or a little less than a year ago, Robert Mayhew of the FBI, who was running the ex-FBI gaming tables and so forth, was given a letter you know, when Mr. Hughes went all the way, he was down in the Bahamas again in Jamaica or in the Bahamas, slipped out in the dead of night with a letter that Mr. Mayhew is to leave the scene. He's fired. Now, what was that all about? That was exactly the way I thought it would happen. I thought that they were there partly to squeeze out the mafia and um, come down on J. Edgar Hoover. Now, why did Time Magazine run these articles? Uh, the whole point of it is this that J. Edgar Hoover has been very paranoid and limited in his scope. He is not a total police state man. As bad as you think he is, there's worse to come. There's worse. There's John Mitchell and that team, and we're going to go into that in the selection of justices. Mr. Hoover will look pretty good when I'm through. Yes, we'll take just a moment to say that you're listening to Dialogue Assassination with Mae Brussel, this is KLRB Stereo FM, Carmel by the Sea. What kind of a file do I have? Well, after I started working on political assassinations and worked with what I call the hard evidence like ballistics or handprints, gun ownership, bullet direction, rifle capability, I knew something was wrong with the handling of the evidence and with the final conclusions of the Warren report that didn't match the exact finding of the ballistics. So I began certain files like CIA or FBI or ballistics, and I have, I think I've told you, hundreds of categories of information that I keep. But when you get to a subject like FBI, that covers so much that that isn't a file in itself. What do you want to say about the FBI, the way the FBI handles ballistic evidence, the way the FBI tells you a conclusion that isn't based upon actual fact. So I have the following. I have 11 envelopes, manila envelopes, with information or facts on the FBI, and these are the general categories, and then you'll know where, how my head works. One is policies in general. What is their general principle? When they have a graduation, for example, who do they ask to speak? When they want to be recognized or they get medals, what are they given medals for? Where is their head at? Who supports them? Like Mr. Rosenstiel of Shenley Whiskey, he builds a monument to J. Edgar Hoover. He's, he's a way back from the bootleg days. I used to go to the same summer resort with Mr. Rosenstiel for years up in Oden, Michigan. But Shenley uh, Whiskey is 
the group that's building the biggest monument to J. Edgar Hoover. That's one of his closest pals. But I, I have a envelope called FBI Policies in General. Then I have another one called Friends, Sympathetic to the Agency. When somebody speaks up and defends them or speaks for them, who goes to speak for them? Who are their friends? Then I have one on the political structure. What is their political structure? Where is their head? They're an investigative agency, but are they far right? Are they far left? Uh, what do they mouth about communism or fascism? Do they come down on the Nazis or do they entertain them? They come down on the communists, we know. But where are they politically? How far one way or the other? I keep a information thing on the boss, Mr. Hoover who his roommate is, who his friends are. Uh, there's nothing there about any dates or anything like that, but contacts or finances, donations, who as a person is giving him money, you know, and so forth. Then I have one on his enemies, who criticizes him. What do they say? Like Bill Turner, who's written a book on the FBI. Um, he used to be an agent, and he's written a book on J. Edgar Hoover. Fred Cook, who wrote a book, The FBI Nobody Knows, who just recently wrote an article for um, Nation magazine on the Committee to Investigate Assassinations and political assassinations. That's his specialty. He used to be an FBI man. His specialty now is political assassination. Then I just recently in my research about two years ago got turned on to the strong relationship of J. Edgar Hoover with the Mafia, which I wasn't aware of at all until people from Texas brought me so many things. So when you read in the newspaper Jack Anderson about debts that Hoover owes Merchinson down at Del Mar Racetrack, or he accepts their hospitality and uh, goes to the racetrack. I wasn't aware that this is J.J. Hoover's only hobby, is horses, and that people up in Canada and the syndicate, I never realized until two years ago how deeply involved he was with the mafia. So when Howard Hughes came out and, and the disclosure that the gaming tables in Vegas are run by Robert Mayhew, who was a former FBI who runs the, the mafia. Those were all the skimming money and, and uh, mafia money comes from. I didn't know until just about two years ago the connection of J. Edgar Hoover with the mafia. So then I had to start a new section called, you know, Hoover, the racetrack people. Then I could see why the intense hatred of Bobby Kennedy, because when he wanted to come down on the mafia, you know, then it was a different story. Or when you get Valachi, who was one of the mafia men, and he's taken to a jail in Washington and given protection and put in a penthouse, and he can only tell a certain amount. He didn't really stop the strings of the mafia from working, and nothing great happened, but Valachi had protection. When Jack Ruby wanted to go to Washington and be protected, Jay Hoover wouldn't let him. And Ruby told Earl Warren, but I'll be dead. You won't ever hear what happened. You won't see me again. And this was in July, right after the assassination, the following year, Ruby was dead, and they didn't see him. He couldn't have the protection that a mafia man had who wanted to talk. So I keep a file on Jager who on the mafia, and I keep one on FBI killings, because this is an area that is horrendous. And this is an area that I am crusading for. I have a lot of things going to work, if changes to affect glory in our society. And one is that the investigative agencies... The FBI is set up to find out who robs the bank, who kidnaps your child, who kidnaps your husband or wife. Federal crimes across the line, they are not supposed to kill. The CIA is to gather intelligence, and these two agencies kill constantly. And there's trial going down in Arizona about the FBI using uh, an ex-Marine to do a killing and make it look like the mafia did it. Or when Columbus was shot in New York just a while ago, he's still in a coma, he didn't die. His son said, the FBI and the CIA killed my father, the same people that killed John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King. Everybody is on to these agencies. And we're going to talk in a, in a few minutes about a new committee to investigate J. Edgar Hoover. It, victims of J. Edgar Hoover have formed a committee. So I have a list of killings and that I have saved that would be valuable this committee. The families know who are the victims, but I watch them too because this agency, every agency in the United States, simply has to stop killing and do what it is set up to do or its bosses should be removed from office and tried for these murders. And that day will come in our nation. It has to come. Uh, we have evidence. I keep a, a section on the FBI CIA killings and then I keep another section on the FBI-CIA mafia murders, where the three work together. 
a man named Mr. Roselli was arrested in Los Angeles at the Friars Club uh, for gambling indiscretions in Beverly Hills. Grant Cooper was attorney for him and asked that he be given a lower sentence because he was a mafia man for sure, but he was hired by Robert Mayhew in Las Vegas and the CIA six times that he was sent to Cuba trying to kill Castro, and he couldn't do it. But because he's an agent of the FBI and CIA, the mafia suspect wants a shorter sentence. Unheard of. And then I keep a section on agent provocateurs, FBI people, informers in disguise, radicals, hippies, Tommy the Traveler, and that kind of thing. So I keep a file on J. Edgar Hoover, just like he keeps a file on me, I'm sure. Now, what happened to J. Edgar Hoover? What is Time magazine saying? It said that under, this is a quote, under J. Edgar Hoover's dictatorial seven-year rule, the Federal Bureau of Investigation has in the past been regarded... 47. 47-year rule. Yeah. He has been regarded as one of the finest law enforcement agencies in the world. Yet, now the 76-year-old director's fiefdom shows evidence of crumbling. The FBI spirit is sapped. Its morale is low. Its initiative is stifled. And there are, no, there are doubts about the FBI's ability to serve as an effective agency against subversion, end quote. This is what I thought would happen, that yous would come in, then slip out, and they, in four years they would break down the whole tone of the FBI. I know that there are people in government who listen to these tapes, and they go to Washington, and Evelyn Younger's office listens. He's an FBI man, our attorney general of the state. The FBI has done wonderful jobs. It's done good jobs. It has done some terrible things. It's, it is a balance in between. But now, Mr. Hoover is going to feel the pinch of what a real police state is because I'm not defending J. Edgar Hoover, but what I feel now is that he is being cut off and strangled from the large body of a new power force. The article blamed J. Edgar Hoover for going out in all directions and irritation with an agent who is in Colorado, and it claims now that J. Edgar Hoover is cut off from the CIA, Defense Intelligence Agency, and contact with other intelligence units. That's a quotation from Time. One more of May Bressel's predictions right on the line. This would happen to the FBI. I said this would happen, and now it, it is going J. Edgar Hoover is going to get the same treatment he gave Bobby or John Kennedy or Martin Luther King. They may not kill him, but they're discrediting him, and he is cut off from all the intelligence gathering in the country. Now, the quotation in time, I'm reading once more again, said, A tangle of political ironies surrounds the director's present relation with the Nixon administration. The president and the attorney general, John Mitchell, have been hoping for months to ease Hoover out with great ceremony Public thanks for his long, remarkable career. Now, my analysis of the situation is this. We'll end that quote. That Hoover is an old guard conservative. Like, uh, we, have, we could name a thousand of them. He made many mistakes in his judgment. He has that 19th century mind we talked about and all its paranoia. He has no family. He's close to his mother. He was. He's hung up on sexuality. He's repressed. He transferred all of these frustrations like 99% of the traditional church of the past into God. God traveled with him and mommy. And Hoover is a product of our past. And just like the Pope and the priests and the nuns, the old Catholic church, God, God <laughs> went with them. And the problem with communism, the czar being thrown out, that was bad. We've had other things happen. When this communist threat came, that scary economic threat to divide all what I call the goodies of the world, that was pretty bad. You know, to take the oil and land and the farms and minerals and say everyone's going to have a share, that would scare Jake pretty much. But he's not a land of gentry, so it didn't scare him. But when you say God's going out there, that was too much for Jake. And he got so hung up on this godless communism and his anti-communist thing that he went gung-ho after those anti-communists all his life. So at the dockyards in New York and at Marseille, all over the world, he hired the mafia to find the communists because he wasn't afraid of the mafia. He wasn't afraid of anybody like a communist. A communist, if you took his God, you took away from him everything that existed. And i not putting down the place of religion. For those who are wondering, I am a religious person. Believe it or not, I really am. 
but he was too extreme in his fears. He had not very much to hold on to if you read the story of his life and what was going for J. Edgar Hoover, and many people like him. They are the ones, if you look around, who screams the most about the communists. And they hold on to that church, and they hold on to that God, and their kids have left, and they're left with nothing else, and their world is crumbling so fast. We haven't got time to write their obituaries. So we'll just give a quick moment. So J. Edgar Hoover, he had his racetracks, and he had his horses and the syndicate, and it goes from California to Canada. And this was his recreation. This was his lifetime. This was his whole thing. And he made errors like Alan Dulles and John Foster Dulles, they made errors. They wanted to move the world. They couldn't. These old men made our foreign policy with China. If you open your paper this morning, the nations overruled the United States. They're not behoven to our money anymore. We're all going to trade. We're all going to get along. We don't have to be afraid of each other. And the yellows are going to make it, and the blacks are going to make it, and there's room for the whites. And everyone's going to have little ships and airplanes going back, and they're going to trade their clothes and all the things the world makes. I read in the fashion section yesterday of the Chronicle that the new thing, how the China's going to Nixon, is the Chinese clothes. Women, you know, the new fashion in the spring is going to be your Chinese clothes. And the San Francisco stores are getting the peasant uh, shirts and the pants and the, and the canvas shoes, and we're going to dress like Chinese coolies and all the women and brocade coats for evening. And it's going to be one big splash because there's a culture of thousands of years of China dishes and music and tastes and sounds. And they'll get out their Chinese cookware and the recipes. And all of a sudden, the American children are going to find out that there's a culture way out there. Just like uh, your Sundays had an article today on the Hopi Indian. And there's a culture of the American Indian we're going to discover, too. And it isn't that... One religion has a way. The book of the Hopi goes into the Hope, you know, beautiful religion. It's, I believe it is part of my religion. All of them can incorporate. So J. Edgar Hoover is left there. And he's hysterical, and he can't go back. But what about Jake? What's the alternative to J. Edgar Hoover? Well, you better watch out, because when Richard Nixon and Mitchell have their mind on something, I worry. And my concern as a research analyst the political assassinations, and I consider myself an expert on the subject. I followed the rise of Nazis and butchers and Führers in the United States, and this team of uh, Richard Nixon and Spiro Agnew and John Mitchell and John Conley and Ronald Reagan and Rockefeller and a group of men in Arizona and Jamaica and Miami and Texas and Los Angeles are working, and this is your last chance. This is the last chance in America. They'll push out J. Edgar Hoover and his agency from any, whoever succeeds from him will be cut off from all the intelligence gathering. But you're going to have something different. We are on the brink, I feel. Right now, the newspaper is filled with, with information of candidates for the 72 elections, and it all is just covering over the real issues. We're on the brink of a 1971-72 Weimar Republic. We're at that point versus a Monday in January 30th, 1933. And I'm going to read a quotation from the rise and fall of the Third Reich. Hitler went to the chancellery, and a few moments later, Goebbels and others witnessed the miracle. The man with a Charlie Chaplin mustache, who had been down and out tramp in Vienna in his youth, an unknown soldier of World War I, derelict in Munich in post-war days, somewhat comical leader of the Beer Hall, spellbinder, not even German but Austrian, 43 years old, was administered the oath as chancellor of the German Reich. The Third Reich was referred to as the Thousand-Year Reich, and Hitler boasted it would endure for a thousand years. I'm continuing the quotation from the rise and fall of the Third Reich. It is remarkable how little those of us who were stationed in Germany during the Nazi time, journalists, diplomats, really knew what was going on behind the facade. A totalitarian dictatorship, by its very nature, works in secret. It works in great secrecy, and it knows how to preserve that secrecy from the prying eyes of outsiders. It was easy to describe Hitler's accession to power, but the fateful decisions secretly made, the intrigues, the treachery, the motives, the aberrations which led them to them, played by the principal actors behind the scene, the extent of the terror they exercised and their technique for organizing it, that remained hidden until the secret German papers were turned up after the war. End quote. Why do I refer to this now? Because in Washington, everything done is in secret. Richard Nixon is isolated from people. Wilbur Mills is not making a decision on the economy. 
Roy Ash is making it, who's connected with the overthrow of Greece. Um, the Pentagon Papers, they tried to stop everything. It, that was secret. Thousands of papers were taken down to Texas that are secret. Millions of papers. Lyndon Johnson comes out with a book. It's all, everything he doesn't want to put in there is secret. The information on the assassination of John Kennedy, 75 years to be locked up, secret. Um, the cabinet, no longer needed, bypassed completely, secret. Mr. Rogers, our Secretary of State, doesn't go to China. Kissinger goes there. All secret. What is said is secret. How they got to power, what John Mitchell did before he got into his position is secret. Why he chooses a man like Mr. Reinquist, who we don't know a thing about, uh, will remain a secret until researchers go into it. Or his other choice, Mr. Powell, he simply had a law practice or he was president of the local board of education. Everything else is secret. The researchers will have to go into who their clients were, who they represented, what political spectrum, what munitions factories. All The only way to stop this Reich that Hitler talked about that would last a thousand years is to delve into these secrets. That's why I do my research in Game Back the Newsday article. The man said, we're doing this investigation, this type of investigative reporting again, to find out who runs the country. And you people out there who listen, get books, get information that I talk about if you haven't read some of those now. And keep reading your newspapers. And every time you see something that says national security, it's a secret. Make a fuss about it. Call people up. Write to the congressman. Let's not have any secrets because this is the way we're tying ourselves off. Now, we have an article to discuss on J. Edgar Hoover that was written up in the newspaper. It may be in tonight's Herald. I don't know. It was by Tom, it was William Buckley, and it was in um, yesterday's paper. But instead of carrying, it was in the San Jose Mercury. Yeah. yeah. But last night, Buckley didn't put it in the Herald. And it's about a committee investigating J. Edgar Hoover that held a meeting in Princeton. And this particular committee is for people who are victims of J. Edgar Hoover. Is that a turning point, Gloria? And, of course, William Buckley is putting it down, and he's making fun of all the people there who have been anti-Hoover people. But in terms of political assassinations, I think it's important for me to point out that the members of this committee... Uh, who met at Woodrow Wilson, Woodrow Wilson School in Princeton last weekend, are involved with John Kennedy. One of the members of this committee is going to be um, Leonard Bernstein, who works with the Panthers. Another one is Burke Marshall, the assistant attorney general during the Kennedy years. Burke Marshall is the man who holds the key to the National Archives that could be opened up. He holds the code of John Kennedy's. Show where the bullet holes if they want. The committee is is called uh, Public Justice for Victims of J. Edgar Hoover. Fred Cook, the gentleman I mentioned who's on the Committee to Investigate Assassinations, is on this particular committee. He claims that Alger Hiss was framed by Richard Nixon, and I met somebody who's done six years research on this subject who said new evidence is coming out on that, too. And uh, Martin Peretz from Harvard, a philanthropist, there's a lot of movie people uh, that are going into this investigation and that have been invited on the committee. And Marine Commandant General David Shoup, who has been talking about war crimes since uh, the Vietnam thing. Now, it could be that they're going to set up a tribunal like we had after the war in Germany. A lot of people say, well, what are you going to do with all this research? What? Where can it go? Can you stop the elections in 72? What if you did? Or who's going to run that would change things differently? I would like to see a group of people set up like the, going to replace in China Mao Zedong and, and has said that there will be 21-man committee. They're not going to have one man rule the government anymore. And I would like to see, um, there's going to be a lot of trouble in this country, and I would like to see a sensible group of people moving in a direction with alternatives, which I've been thinking about in the event that what I sh am saying is true. Because out of Long Island is this exposure now that's going to come down on all of Richard Nixon's world, uh, financially, socially, uh, in every other way. There's an interesting article in the paper this week, two articles about Richard Nixon. One was about his housekeeper who was caught for burglary at a shopping center, and she had some dresses she had stolen, and the police covered it up nicely and said the woman was hypnotized at somebody from the parking lot. 
went up to her and sprayed something in her face and hypnotized her and the judge there let her off of the charge and said, heaven help the president if this could happen to this woman. Now, I don't know whether they're just covering up because somebody in his immediate vicinity had stolen. But the very interesting thing was, uh, this was about Tuesday that that happened. And on Saturday or Sunday's paper, there was an article that Richard Nixon went to sleep. He went to Camp David over the weekend, and Tricia and her husband were down there. And he went to sleep. And they made an article that he went to sleep for 14 hours and didn't wake up. <laughs> so maybe they're spraying Richard with the same spray. <laughs> Uh, and they're setting the stage for something that's going to happen that somebody close to him could really, this is very unusual that he sleeps as long as made the newspaper. The other choice is that he didn't have Bibi Raboza with him, maybe, and he had to go to bed. Because uh, with all these scandals and with the things coming out about Bibi Raboza, he's going to have to physically separate himself from this particular man. But what is happening when, when Bobby Kennedy's... Um, pal and investigator is bringing up these scandals of Richard Nixon and Bibi Rose Raboza in the Florida area and Smathers and defense industry and the mafia and a group at Princeton University now heavily financed uh, it names other people Mrs. Marshall Field, Mrs. Eleanor Gimbel and Charles Goodell who used to, uh, he was a senator from uh, New York and Mr. Buckley replaced him uh, he took his place. There, oh, and Arthur Schlesinger is on the committee. Oh. Yeah, and there's a historian through the Kennedy period, and Jules Pfeiffer is on this committee to investigate the victims, and Ramsey Clark, the victims of J. Edgar Hoover. The list, uh, I could read it, the people on it, Ramsey Clark, Miss Lillian Hellman, the playwright, Burke Marshall, the attorney for Ted Kennedy, Leonard Bernstein, the movie people are Warren Beatty, Paul Newman, uh, Candice Bergman and Shirley MacLaine. Now those four names mean a lot to me too because that's the crowd that's friendly with Jane Fonda and Peter Fonda and Mark Lane. And he travels in Hollywood with those people. And Mark Lane, you all know that name in terms of assassination research. So this is something that has may have a lot of political implications, this committee. I don't know yet uh, how far-reaching it's going to be, whether it could exchange the whole power in the United States before the 72 election, whether it could bring people to trial. It just came out in the paper yesterday, and because of the people on the committee and knowing where their heads are at and knowing how late it is in the game, something has to come of that breaking with the Newsday story. Now, in the weeks of, in the week that follows, we're going to have to sit and watch the appointments to the Supreme Court. John Mitchell is a man that people fear. A lot of people really fear him. I have quotations of different articles. I went down through my file, as I say, looking for what I could find about William Reinquist and Mr. Powell to see if their names ring any bells. But in looking through those files, it always makes my hair stand on him, the decisions that John Mitchell makes. And we have to remember that William Reinquist is a top official in the Justice Department and that he endorses those policies. And when you think of the Justice Department, I think of Richard Kleinitz, who's a deputy attorney general from Arizona, who said in Atlantic Magazine that people who demonstrate it should be rounded up and be put in detention camps. And I think of Will Wilson, who was the second man under John Mitchell in the Justice Department until he stepped down last week because of his tax problems or his banking problems with his clients in Texas. And I'm do research on that this week. I have all the articles, but I haven't concentrated on that the way I should. And that seems not involved the mafia and underworld, too. This is why he stepped out, because those connections are being exposed. And Will Wilson said that student protesters should be put in the penitentiary. So when you think of John Mitchell's laws that he's put through so far, uh, the no-knock law, entry without charges being made, and he speaks about the he's afraid of permissiveness, and the position he's taken when the Panthers were shot down and prison conditions and his putting down the intellectuals and the radicals. When you think of John Mitchell, the image in my mind is like a Goering or a Himmler or, and his men could be little Eichmann. So when I see what Will Wilson has said and Richard Klein has said, I am anxious to see what William Reinquist, what they come up with, his frame of mind, uh, if he supports the other possibilities. The, the team is getting tighter and then Mr. Nixon has the control of three appointments plus the Chief Justice 
and that's making the Supreme Court pretty heavy. Before we go up there, I want to make one commit correction in Mr. Smath is with the Air Force. It's the Air Transport Command that he was in as a civilian navigator. He was not in the, I said Strategic Air Command. He was not a um, uh, enlisted in the Army as such. He was a civilian navigator for the unit of the Air Transport Command, which took planes from Miami to Africa and the Gold Coast of Africa. Well, may, uh, maybe we can do another program on the possibilities for the Supreme Court. We didn't really, oh, we just barely touched on them. Today. Oh, yeah, there was one outrageous quotation. I wanted to say that John Mitchell met with a group of black uh, members of Congress or officials, and they were having some confrontations. And John Mitchell said to the group, you better be informed. In, you'd be better informed if instead of listening to what I say, you watch what we do. End quote. John Mitchell said to these particular men. And this is what I'm trying to tell the people, Gloria, on the show. I read what these people say in the newspaper. And then I file, you know, where they go, where their trips are, who they're meeting, you know, what their connections are. Because the total thing of what they do is what they are. And if you take these candidates for what they say, you're going to be in the same bind and end up with a funny little Hitler maybe dressed up like Spiro Agnew. You know, this this is the comical person that nobody would believe could really make it. But he can, you see. And uh, so to repeat that again, John Mitchell said to this group, you'd be better informed if instead of listening to what I say, you watch what we do. You suggest that we watch what they do. Yes, yeah. Keep your eyes open and think of what I say, and uh, I hope you gain something from it. Yeah. Thank you, May, again. You've been listening to Dialogue. is a presentation of the Public Affairs and Special Events Department of KLRB News.